Let's take a history lesson. Let us stand on the edge of every decade for the last 50, 60 years and see if on the edge of a decade, we had the imagination or the understanding or the knowledge to actually predict what would happen in that decade. Gandhiji's greatest achievement was not, in my view, freedom from British rule. His greatest achievement was freedom from fear. It was fear that had changed India to colonialism. It was fear of the British that kept us where we were, in, in the prisons of the mind. And one of the principal conflicts of the 21st century will not be over geography. It will be over ideology. It will be between democracy and dictatorship. Knowledge is the only thing that grows when you give it away. And uh, we really need to think about it. And uh, I think one of the great things that have, have, has happened in the last 30, 40 years has been the expansion of the knowledge base across our country. That is one of the true revolutions of our time. Uh, second was, I think Chetan used the term Middle East. I recall I was at Manama at uh, speaking uh, at their very famous uh, international forum, and they had uh, titled their uh, talk uh, or their subject, their theme was on the Middle East. I was in Bahrain, and the first thing I asked, I said, you've used the term Middle East. Can you kindly explain to me uh, the middle of which East are you in? Right? <laughs> they are not the Middle East, they are West Asia. They are the Middle East only if your world starts uh, within the embrace of the British Empire and begins from London and goes to India. Then you are in the middle of the East. Otherwise, you are West Asia. And it's extremely important that we understand the terminology that we use. Fortunately, a lot of the world now has begun to correct the imperial colonial terminology. but words shape understanding words convey sometimes more than we ourselves uh, uh, you know think it, they do to our subject then and uh, before uh, after i got your warm invitation i got uh, two telephone calls one was from ashok of course and thank you a very warm conversation and then I got a call from my very, very old and dear friend, Gopal Hasur, who was like the great, honest policeman he is, very stern. He told me, don't be boring. And, you know, and I, I of course, I, you know, as usual, I obeyed, obeyed him immediately. And I think what Gopal was worried about, that when you have a subject like ideology, then the tendency to be boring is almost uh, is both immediate and probably inevitable. But Gopal and friends, the word that intimidates me is not ideology so much as the 21st century. Time is a very unique fact in our lives. There is a great saying, a proverb, Whoever has made a New Year's wish has not met God. Let's take a history lesson. Let's take a history lesson. Let us stand on the edge of every decade for the last 50, 60 years and see if on the edge of a decade we had the imagination or the understanding or the knowledge to actually predict what would happen in that decade. If you stand in 1960 and think about what will happen in 1960s, who would have predicted the 1962 war? Who would have predicted the 1965 war, indeed 1967, um, the 1967 uh, famine or the loss of power for the first time uh, by the Congress? 
stand on the edge of 1970. And be honest, who would have predicted that in 1971, Pakistan would have split apart? The whole idea of Pakistan would have self-destructed. And it's a point to which I will return later on in my intervention or in my conversation with you. Who would have predicted uh, 1975? Who would have predicted the emergency of 1976? Who would have predicted 1977, the general elections? Stand on the edge of 1980. Who among us could have predicted Operation Blue Star? Stand on the edge of 1990. Who would have imagined that India would have had such almost radical economic reforms? Or uh, that by the end of that decade, thanks to Prime Minister Vajpayee, we would have gone, we would have broken the nuclear apartheid, challenged it, ended it. Or indeed, that Kargil would have happened. Stand on the edge of 2000, and I said, use this international phenomenon because it was truly international. Who could have predicted 9-11? And the implication it, for it for us and for the rest of the world, who could have predicted the terrorist attacks that took place in that decade in Mumbai, in parliament, and so on, you stand on the edge uh, just to change uh, uh, it. Uh, but stand on the in uh, on the edge of the in uh, 2010. Who could have predicted the Modi era and the great advances that have taken place in technology? So, when we think about the future, the one thing that we must be certain about is that the future is uncertain. The future is almost inevitably more dramatic. I take you now to another instance in order to understand the meaning of the terms we use, century. When does a century begin? A century is not necessarily a calendar event. For me, a century begins when the most significant event that shapes the century happens. So in our century, 21st century, I would say 9-11, uh, and the role of terrorism in our lives is the real beginning. In the 20th century, I think the 20th century began with the First World War. And after the First World War, the things that happened, which are not fully understood, but they are critical to our understanding of the 21st century. The end of the First World War signaled the destruction of two political or polities that had controlled human life ever since recorded history. One was feudalism, dynasty, the rule of kings, which was taken so much for granted, and the second was colonization. In 1918, you must always remember, by the way, that while the British Empire was immoral, it was never illegal. Conquest, conquest of nations was considered legitimate until 1946 and the creation of uh, the United Nations. And that too owes its origins to 1918 because after 1918, with the destruction of great empires like the Tsarist, like the Ottoman Empire, like the Habsburg Empire, from there emerged the first idea of the modern age, that is the nation state. It took a while for the nation state to find its mooring, sure. Such a major historic event is not going to happen in a hurry. But the nation state has from in steps, it has now become the principal building block of the architecture of stability all across the world. India became the first major post-colonial nation state. India also became the nation state which provided, I think, the four pillars of modernity. It was a modern nation state. Now, uh, when we use words like modern, 
uh, we have to understand what they mean. Modernity is not dress. One of the great, uh, almost infantile uh, assumptions, I, I, I don't know how precisely it came, has come across, but we always confuse modernity with dress. This is what we did. This is one of the kind of collateral, uh, collateral, uh, not benefits, but collateral damages of British colonialism. And so when we think of Gandhi and Jinnah, uh, we think of Jinnah as a modern figure, just because he wore, he wore three-piece uh, bespoke three-piece suits. And we think of Gandhi as a sort of uh, anti-modern because he wore a dhoti. Gandhi wore a dhoti for a very simple reason, which he told the British when he went uh, to Buckingham Palace in order to meet King George V in 1931. And they insisted that he come in the dress, formal dress of the court. And he refused. He says, I will dress like the Indian people. And he was proud of it. Modernity, in fact, Jinnah, for all his three-piece suits, had a medieval mind, had a regressive mind. And we shall understand, understand that. And Gandhi established the four pillars. What are the four pillars of modernity? One, democracy. Number two, freedom of faith. Religion as an accepted part of our rights, freedom of faith, and freedom of faith, by the way, includes the freedom to be an atheist. Third, gender emancipation. Fourth, freedom from poverty. Freedom from the British would mean nothing if it did not include, include freedom from poverty. Think about it. What was, you know, uh, Gandhiji's greatest achievement? Gandhiji's greatest achievement was not, in my view, freedom from British rule. His greatest achievement was freedom from fear. It was fear that had changed India to colonialism. It was fear of the British that kept us where we were, in, in the prisons of the mind. Gandhiji, once Gandhiji liberated us from fear, the liberation of India was only a matter of time. In, uh, I won't mention the name, but in 1918, 1919 and 1920, a very prominent Indian, uh, well, uh, civil servant, a very good mind. Uh, when he started, when Gandhiji started his non-cooperation movement, uh, this gentleman said, what does this man in a dhoti think he's doing? The British will rule us for 400 years. That was the conventional thinking of this time. Once Gandhiji started his liberation movement, the British could not last even 25 years. And once India became free in 1947, the whole colonial enterprise of Europe, which was built on the ideology of the past, collapsed, disappeared. I tell you, if Gandhiji had not been an Indian, if he had been a foreigner, the Anglican classes of India would have had more respect for him. But because he was Indian, right, we seem to take him for granted. Just think, my friends, of what he achieved. He built his whole liberation movement on an ideological basis. And the core of that ideology, that principle, was nonviolence. We think that nonviolence only achieved the freedom of India? No. Nonviolence was the most important idea of the 20th century. Nonviolence achieved, Gandhi achieved far, far more than Lenin and Mao, than any contemporary leader, because nonviolence led not only to the liberation of India from colonialism, it ended colonialism. I think only Algeria uh, and maybe uh, Kenya had uh, violent uh, independent struggle movements. 
and they were forced to. Otherwise, the rest of the colonial world ended through nonviolence. Nonviolence ended communism. It happened. I'm sure most of us is, uh, are here. Remember that. How the Soviet Union collapsed. The Soviet Union did not collapse. It's a word superpower. It did not collapse uh, with any armed struggle. It collapsed out of a nonviolent people's movement. Nonviolence ended apartheid, a curse upon humanity. In South Africa, nonviolence ended racism against blacks in America. How much more can one idea achieve in basically two lifetimes? In fact, I, can, uh, I can't resist an observation, which is that uh, in the 20th century, atheists inflicted more violence, killed more people than perhaps anyone, and they were the communists. In Russia, and just the number of Chinese killed by Mao, nobody has actually ever counted how many millions were killed by people who thought that they could deliver on an economic policy without a moral compass. But Gandhiji taught us that the moral compass was as important as part of a nation's ideology as anything else. And without that moral compass, we would in fact provide an invitation to our more, most extreme uh, traits and characteristics of the human nature. The power of nonviolence uh, I have uh, dwelt on. The power of Gandhiji's ideas I have dwelt on and shown how much they impact. But, and that too, that is one reason why we maintain as part of our doctrine uh, what Prime Minister Modi says very often, that war is not a solution for the problems of the 21st century. Let's see. We know there are skeptics who will not believe it, who will never recognize it, but that does not mean that we give up our endeavor and our belief in non-aggression. I'm proud to say that India is one nation which has never attacked or been an aggressor. However, our commitment to nonviolence is not a commitment to meek pacifism. Because we don't believe in aggression does not mean that we do not understand what should be done to an enemy. We are very clear in our minds. Not an inch of territory shall we surrender to the invader. And any time there is terrorism, Whoever perpetrates terrorism will be accountable. But when, and I am asked this very often, and I submit this to you, I am asked what is the ideology of the modern Indian state? And I say, India is a nationalist power. India is among the few countries who actually believe in their nation and in nationalism. And our nationalism is based on a shared civilizational culture. It is based on a humanism. Humanism is not a weak concept, my friend. Humanism is a powerful concept. Without that, there can be no order. There can be no sustenance. In fact, without it, there can be no modernity. If modernity has to have a meaning, it is the elimination of the barbaric which is also a huge human temptation. It is the end of fascism. Now, uh, in the experience of India, and in India's search for modernity and establishment of modernity, I mentioned the four pillars. I will repeat them, because sometimes repetition helps. The four pillars are one, freedom of speech, freedom of voice, freedom of uh, political choice, a right to turn governments over through a vote. 
second freedom of faith third gender emancipation if women are not equal you cannot be modern and fourth of course complete elimination of poverty as long as you have poverty we cannot call ourselves modern but on these criteria on these criteria india is a successful ideological state china is not china may be successful but china is not modern because the chinese don't have democracies in fact the chinese people have never had democracy ever since the birth of the first man and number 2 the chinese do not permit freedom of conscience and freedom of faith until to do that china cannot call itself a modern state and one of the principal conflicts of the 21st century will not be over geography it will be over ideology it will be between democracy and dictatorship all dictators all dictators claim uh, claim credibility acceptance with the argument of the common good democracies no the common good can only be determined by the common will it cannot be determined by a selected oligarchy a selected monarchy or a selected handful of people this as i said will be uh, one of them the second major conflict of the century will be around again an experience which we had in our history and in the history of liberation from colonialism side by side with the ideas of modernity which by the way we became a part of our political constitution in 1931 in 1929 30 we had purna swaraj in the following say, congress session at karachi gandhi ji wrote the resolution uh, which defined our basic freedoms which were later incorporated into the constitution which is what i have uh, just mentioned so it's been part of our faith been part of our doctrine uh, for all through the freedom movement the constitution was born through the freedom movement not the other way around but alongside came an idea that religion could become the basis of nationalism and most particularly in the case of uh, the perpetrator or the creator of pakistan mohammad ali jinnah he put forth the argument that islam is sufficient as a basis for nationalism i tell you nothing can be more wrong than that nothing could be more absurd than that islam in the quran is a brotherhood it is not a nationhood islam cannot be imprisoned in one country even the quran describes allah as rabbul alamin as god of the whole universe he is not described as rabbul muslimin as god only of the muslims leave alone god only of pakistani muslims to trap a nation into a religion let us be clear even in our country no religion can be the basis of our nationalism the hindus of nepal will remain loyal to nepal their deep commitment to hinduism will not make them loyal to india why should they be no religion can be the basis of nationalism in fact jinnah was a medieval mind right but as i said the uh pseudo anglican class treated him as modern because he spoke uh, 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 you know clipped accent english right and i said gandhi ji wore the clothes of the peasant i'm sure some of you most of you know the story some of you know the story but i still will uh, uh, will put it out not least because i always remember uh, my friend gopal's uh, very very strong instruction not to be boring so i think perhaps an anecdote would uh, uh, <laughs> would bring a smile or two 
And this bet, it happened. In 1931, when Gandhiji went, as I said, to uh, Buckingham Palace wearing a dhoti, when he came out of it, the British media, which is never short of questions, although it is very often short of answers, but British media asked Gandhiji that were you, were you sufficiently dressed for His Majesty King George V? And Gandhiji replied, oh, don't worry, the king had enough clothes for both of us. And <laughs> at another time, I don't know if you know the phrase plus fours, which is a kind of uh, dress that is worn. But uh, so he said, you know, the British wear plus fours, I wear minus fours. What can I do? But this is the dress of the Indian people. This refusal to accept Gandhiji never accepted partition. That is the theme of uh, my book, Gandhi's Hinduism, The Struggle Against Jinnah's Islam. He never accepted partition. In fact, on 15th August 1947, his heart was so broken that when All India Radio and BBC came to ask him whether he had any message, imagine, this is the man, let, let, us, not, let us acknowledge it, this is the man who led the nation to freedom. Not the only person who led the friendship, but I'm quite sure among the giants, the greatest of the giants, he said, I have nothing to say. He had no words to say because this was not the India that he had dreamed of. For him, India began with the borders of Iran and continued till the borders of Burma. But history defeated Gandhi because of false idea. If Islam was sufficient as a basis for nationalism, my friends, why would there be 22 Arab countries? If Islam was sufficient as a basis for nationalism, why would Pakistan and Afghanistan be different countries? There is no evidence in history for such a claim, and yet that claim was give, made reality on our subcontinent in order to rip apart, rip apart the present and future of India. Because I think the British knew that India had the capacity to become the power of the 21st century. As the 21st century unfolds before us, as the 21st century unfolds before us, we are beginning to see that India, not because Indians are superheroes or supermen or superwomen, but because Indians have a super idea that India will be among the leaders which will take the 21st century into the direction of modernity. This is the template and this is the model. Whenever we analyze Pakistan, my friends, we tend to do so on the perspective of Pakistan's birth of 47, what happened. Just remember, what you see depends entirely on from where you look. If you want to understand Pakistan, don't look at the birth of Pakistan. Look at the death of Pakistan in 1971. In 1971, it was not a nation which had just been partitioned again. No. The idea of Pakistan was annihilated because at the very minimum, more than 50% of Pakistan decided that Islam was not the basis of nationalism. And I dare say that in 1971, if the vote and the option had been given to Baloch and to Sindhis, they too would not have accepted that idea. These two challenges, the challenges, as I said, of whether democracy will be the lead idea of the 21st century and whether religion can be the basis of nationalism, they constitute the ideological challenges of uh, uh, 
uh, of our coming 21st century. And in this idea of gender, yes, India will have hiccups. India will have uncertainties. It is not easy to take a, take a democracy forward. But if you have the courage of conviction, then the rewards are infinite. Rewards are infinite. Uh, once again, heeding the strict orders of my friend Gopalasu, who also told me that to remain, maintain the discipline of Athana, I <laughs> pause here. And if you have questions, of course, and if there is a question answer session, I will be happy to take on and discuss the few ideas I have placed here and see how we can take them forward, how we can then make them part, not only of your thinking, but most of all, if this session has to be, be of any sustainable use, then uh, if you believe in what has been discussed and what I have suggested, then it is, becomes our duty to take these ideas forward because the idea of India is the future of the world. Thank you.